uh, Stuart Hameroff, who is going to talk about, or well, ask the question, does Chomsky's universal grammar for language derive from quantum logic in brain microtubules? Thank you. Thank you all for being here. So um, I'm going to use language, particularly Chomsky's approach to language, as an example of the kind of cognitive problem that can be addressed by quantum uh, logic, quantum cognition, and actually quantum biology. So let me uh, make a statement. First of all, Irina uh, mentioned this, that generally speaking, quantum cognition and the kind of things we're talking about here imply mathematical frameworks of quantum physics in cognitive brain processes, but without necessarily actual quantum physics or quantum biology. However, evidence now points to a robust quantum underground at the core of biomolecules. And I'll argue that quantum biology is real. And it's a very uh, neat trick how this uh, came to be, despite all the criticism over the years. But let's begin with language. And there are three problems with language. One is the poverty of stimulus. That is, when you hear a sentence, uh, there are compressed or absent words that are unintelligible at the time until later acoustic information informs you what they were about. But tests have shown that such words are consciously perceived in real time. This is taken to imply that conscious understanding and actions are constructed after the fact and are illusory. And in fact, this is a general uh, principle in neuroscience and cognitive science where consciousness comes too late. Uh, for example, sensory inputs which come to the thalamus uh, from, from various senses uh, go in three ways. Uh, in the case of vision, the uh, primary visual cortex, then forward to the frontal, front of the brain, and then the third wave results in consciousness denoted here as Bing. So Bing is uh, meant to apply uh, conscious experience. And this takes about 300 milliseconds. <clears throat> However, we often respond seemingly consciously to these inputs before 300 milliseconds, the presumption being we respond non-consciously, conscious actions seemingly epiphenomenal and illusory. And this is the party line in, in, in uh, Western science and philosophy that free will is impossible because of this problem and there are other problems, and we are merely helpless spectators along for the ride, as T.H. Huxley famously said. As an example of this is the color phi effect. So uh, here's a, an observer looking sideways at a screen over here and there is a red sphere that moves over time uh, to the right to become green. And the, if, it, if the timing is right, the observer sees this changing red to green about halfway through. This is what the observer sees. Now, uh, Daniel Dennett, who uh, is part of this, uh, uh, the main guy in this movement that consciousness is epiphenomenal, says what happens is that after the fact, after this delay in the time t, that uh, the brain uh, knows that it's going to turn to green, so fills in that the green uh, uh, occurred halfway through. I should say if you do this repeatedly and try to fool the subject and change this to red, the subject isn't fooled. Uh, so it's not just uh, habituation. Um, so, but this puts consciousness uh, too late in the past, makes it epiphenomenal and after, after the fact. However, there's another explanation because in quantum physics, quantum information can be referred backward in classical time, as, as long as it doesn't uh, cause, uh, 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 as long as there hasn't been a collapse. So another explanation, rather, here's Dennett's Orwellian revision from George Orwell after the fact uh, that the truth is established. The quantum explanation is that actually there's backward in time referral from uh, the time of green, so the observer actually sees this happening. Now this backward time effect has been going on and shown in the brain since at least 1979 in Libet's sensory experiments we heard sh where he showed that conscious experience at the time of the evoked potential here, so if you prick the finger, the, the subject feels it immediately at the time of the uh, 30 or 90 milliseconds to get to the brain. But he also showed that there needs to be ongoing activity for several hundred milliseconds and that this, was, uh, this involved cortical stimulation and conscious experience and neuronal adequacy. But if there were no evoked potential, if there's nothing here, the uh, consciousness happened after 500 milliseconds. So this was a paradox. And he showed in some brilliant experiments that, uh, that if you had thalamic, uh, stim with using thalamic stimulation, that with the evoked potential and ongoing activity, but not sufficient for what he called ne ne neuronal adequacy, uh, that as long as you have the evoked potential, um, excuse me, if you, did, if you did have the 500 milliseconds, 
that the information would be referred backward in time to the time of the evoke potential. And uh, uh, such backward time referral for compressed or absent words, going back to the language, could explain real-time comprehension in, in language and also kind of rescue the possibility of free will because we can be acting in real time due to uh, referral backwards, uh, backwards in time. So that's, that's the first problem with language that could be solved with backward time referral, which does occur in quantum physics. The second is that there are hierarchical fractal-like processes in language. Chomsky first noticed this in 1980, and it's been shown many times, that language is composed of linguistic units arrayed hierarchically, i.e. phonemes, words, phrases, and sentences. So going from top down, from the, the slowest and the largest sentence, is made up of phrases, made up of words, made up of many phonemes. And this was uh, recently shown uh, in a uh, paper by Ding et al. in Nature Neuroscience using both English and Chinese words that there are this particular hierarchical frequency level of EEG processing in, in these languages. And here's from their paper where you start with a sentence and phrases for both English and Chinese and it correlates with uh, 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 a spectrum um, with uh, the slowest, uh, with the fastest uh, uh, being the, the most basic and the slowest being the most uh, global, the sentence. And this can be extrapolated even further. Um, so that each word uh, correlates to a particular hierarchical level but uh, in EEG, but we don't really know the origin of EEG. After all these years, we don't know where EEG comes from. And Roger Penrose and I, in a recent paper, suggested that EEG rhythms are actually beat frequencies of quantum vibrations in microtubules because we argue that consciousness and cognition derives from deeper level processes in microtubules inside neurons. The third issue in language is uh, uh, Chomsky's universal grammar. Uh, he suggested that there must be a logical structure of language somewhere in the brain commonly diagrammed as X-bar, apical branching patterns. And these are X-bar patterns, and there's, there's various derivations of this, where you start with a word, it need not be the, the subject, it need not be a noun, it could be a verb, it could be an adjective, and it branches, and, and, and uh, uh, sentences and language have this branching X-bar structure, and people have uh, used this to, uh, to characterize all forms of language in, in different languages in this branching X-bar structure. But X-bar structures have not been seen in neural networks. People have tried to look at uh, various things in, in spe the speech areas to look for these uh, branching uh, patterns, but they've not, been, uh, they've not been found. Should we look deeper? And I think we must indeed look deeper for the structure of language, but also for quantum uh, processes uh, in the brain. So if we go back to the previous uh, earlier slide of showing the uh, um, thalamic inputs going to cortex in three waves, and then coming into the cortex, we see there are another three waves. The thalamic inputs are from different parts of the cortex go to layer four. Layer four then goes to layers one, two, three, and six. And those layers all converge on layer five pyramidal cells shown in red. These are the giant uh, pyramidal cells whose apical dendrites here give rise to EEG. So th these are where EEG comes from. And the outputs of this after a conscious moment, if you will, send uh, subcortical outputs to do things like move your arms or whatever behavior you're going to do. So it looks like, bang, consciousness is happening in these pyramidal cells in layer five. They may be happening elsewhere, but if you had to pick one place where they're most likely to happen, it's the uh, pyramidal cells. But then we need to go inside the pyramidal cells because, for example, single cell organisms without any synaptic connections do very clever things. And if we look inside, we see the microtubules that uh, Roger and I have uh, discussed over many years, which are Cylindrical polymer lattice is made of individual proteins called tubulin, and the integration occurs in the soma and dendrite and then firing. And consciousness and the results of cognition are almost for sure in dendrites and soma, uh, not in axonal firings. Everybody says firings. Firings are after the fact. Once you have firings, you've probably already had the conscious moment or the cognitive function, and the firings are merely conveying the results of that uh, elsewhere to manifest behavior. So it looks like Bing happens uh, in, in, uh, in microtubules, which are uh, <coughs> uniquely arrayed in these mixed polarity networks of up and down and broken and interrupted. They're part of the cytoskeleton, and if you wanted structural support, you wouldn't break them into little pieces. It'd be like breaking your, your femur uh, into two pieces when you need structural support. They're there for some other reason, 
and it seems to be information processing and perhaps consciousness. So I got interested in microtubules 40-some-odd uh, uh, years ago, and uh, um, here you see uh, different patterns, mic uh, automata patterns. If you make some assumptions that each tubulin can be in two states, interact with the neighbor states, kind of like uh, uh, a cellular automata or a microtubule automata, uh, you increase the information capacity inside each neuron <coughs> tremendously. Uh, but that wouldn't explain consciousness, as I'll mention uh, subsequently. Uh, and then I uh, um, uh, read Roger's book, The Emperor's New Mind, and, uh, and we eventually teamed up to describe quantum, comp quantum computation in microtubules, uh, which I'll come to in a second. I should also, also mention that Alzheimer's disease is really a disease of microtubules. There are the amyloid plaques outside the neurons, but inside neurons, the microtubules uh, disintegrate, and the tau protein falls off, and you get these uh, neurofibrillary tangles, and the microtubules uh, uh, literally fall apart, and you lose memory, you lose cognition, and you lose cognitive function, and eventually consciousness. So microtubules are involved in memory, and it seems to me that contextuality, which uh, has uh, a number of meanings, could also be looked at as memory. If you're doing a process, uh, the, the memory bed, if, uh, particularly if you're doing the process, the cognitive process, directly in the memory bed itself, that would provide context and contextuality. So it turns out that microtubules are, are probably storing memory because uh, the, the party line is that memory is in the synaptic proteins, uh, but these synaptic proteins only last hours to days, and yet memories can last lifetimes. And one of the things that happens in uh, uh, long-term potentiation, a model for memory, is that this enzyme, CAMK2, gets activated and then binds to microtubules and, in, and encodes memory in the cell, in the neuron somehow, and we think it's, it's directly in the microtubules. So this CAMK2 is an interesting uh, molecule. Uh, it's a hexagonal snowflake-shaped molecule. Here it is on side view. When calcium comes in, it activates, and the kinase domains, it, it sprouts six kinase domains above and below the uh, intermediate uh, phase, uh, looking like this. And here are the phosphorylation sites. So we look for something in the cell that might uh, bind and be able to, if you think of these as six uh, bits of information, or actually 12 bits, six up above and six below, where might this be encoded by phosphorylation? And in this paper in 2012, we showed that the CAMK2, uh, and here are the microtubule A lattice and B lattice, we showed that the CAMK2 precisely uh, binds geometrically and size-wise uh, to, uh, to the microtubule lattice. And so our, the idea is that the CAMK2 lands on the microtubule, kind of like the lunar landed on, uh, on the moon uh, 47 years ago today, it was, and leaves a memory trace behind, which is six bits or a byte of information, and then goes on its uh, merry way. And these hexagonal patterns are, again, are, uh, and the branching patterns that we show in microtubule automata, are uh, conducive or consistent with uh, Chomsky's X-bar structure of language. <coughs> Excuse me, in these branching patterns. And the hexagonal uh, information could come in and encode. So uh, we're suggesting that, uh, along with Massimo Piatelli Palmarini, uh, uh, Tom uh, Bever, David Medeiros, and Chomsky himself, are, are looking at this as a possible substrate for his X-bar structure of language. <coughs> Let's say that's true, and we have all this information processing going on. Going on. Um, uh, the normal approach would say 10 to the 16th operations per second for the whole brain, based on neurons as the fundamental unit. But if you go to the microtubule level, you have 10 to the 16th operations per second per neuron, and then 10 to the 27th operations uh, per brain. But where's consciousness? Where's the bing? Is something else required? Is that quantum physics? It was at this point in about 1989 and 1990, I was going around to AI and, and neural network meetings saying, hey, you've got to go down in, inside the neuron. There's all this extra information. Uh, your goalpost is way, way farther out. And somebody said, OK, let's say you're right, uh, wise guy. And, and there is all this. How would that explain consciousness? How would that explain feelings, joy, love, emotion, pain, and so forth? And I had to admit, I didn't have an answer. Fortunately, that person suggested I read uh, Roger's book, uh, The Emperor's New Mind where he uh, uh, deconstructed uh, AI approaches to conscious understanding and suggested a quantum mechanism. And it, 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 the book addressed a number of things, including the measurement problem in quantum mechanics, which is 
to put it in one way, why don't we see quantum superpositions in our perceived world? Now, the first speaker mentioned uh, the measurement problem and went through this, so I'll just uh, briefly uh, say that uh, objects can be in multiple states or locations simultaneously, quantum superposition, yet we observe only one state. Schrodinger thought this was absurd and came up with this famous thought experiment where you have a quantum system outside that uh, uh, superposition and one, pop, one of the two possibilities uh, enters the box, kills the cat, and he said according to the uh, Copenhagen external observer view, which by the way puts consciousness outside science and doesn't really address it, uh, that the cat would be both dead and alive until somebody uh, opened the box and took a look. And Bohr, Wigner von Neumann, Staff, and more recently uh, Chalmers and McQueen have addressed this. So the external observer of the Copenhagen Wigner von Neumann approach is one. Another possibility is decoherence in which any interaction uh, between a quantum superposition and its classical environment disrupts the quantum state. But how can any quantum state truly be isolated? We heard about Everett's multiple worlds where each possibility branches off its own uh, new universe and we have an infinite number of parallel universes. And then, uh, among others, uh, is the approach by Sir Roger Penrose who said basically that self-collapse occurs and this isn't caused by consciousness, but it is consciousness or causes consciousness. And Roger began by taking the problem of superposition seriously. And I've not heard anybody else address how something could conceivably be in two places or states at the same time, other than as some mathematical uh, figment of somebody's imagination. And he did so by combining qu quantum theory and general relativity and using these simple cartoons of taking four-dimensional space-time down to a two-dimensional space-time sheet with one dimension of space, one dimension of time. And we know uh, that according to general relativity, a particle is essentially equivalent to curvature in space-time. So a particle here and a curvature there oscillating back and forth uh, to, between this position and this position would be the curvature moving back and forth. And then a quantum superposition of the two positions of that particle would be two separated curvatures. So here we see a quantum superposition, two particles existing at the same, it's the same particle, I should say, existing at the same time due to separated curvatures in space-time. So this is quantum superposition. So this is the first, and I think the only, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, way to address the possibility of what it conceivably means to be in multiple uh, places or states at the same time, rather than just a mathematical uh, expression. Now you can imagine if these separations were to continue, each one would form its own universe and you would have the multiple worlds interpretation. Here's one going off into universe one, here's another, another one into universe two. Now, <clears throat> Roger said, however, that these separations are unstable and will self-collapse, undergo objective reduction. We will have a uh, quantum state reduction due to an objective threshold, OR, at time t given by h bar over e sub g, where e sub g is the gravitational self-energy of the separation. The more mass or space-time separated from itself, the greater the e sub g and the lower the t, the faster it self-collapse. So at time t, OR occurs and, and here was the, the kicker, that there would be a moment of conscious experience produced, generated, a quantum of, sub, uh, of consciousness, if you will. Or at a very simple level, we might call it proto-consciousness. And this would occur every, every time there's a collapse. He since incorporated decoherence uh, into this, so what is termed decoherence would actually be this. So there would be uh, 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 proto-conscious moments occurring uh, here, there, and everywhere. Now some of these might be uh, pleasurable, and depending on which is selected, some might be unpleasurable. And uh, uh, he also said the selections are not random, they deviate from the Born rule, but are maybe influenced by what uh, he called uh, platonic values in the structure of space-time geometry, perhaps resonating with those platonic values. Uh, other people have noted this, these could uh, correlate with what's called the Akashic Record and Vedanta, uh, Talar de Chardin's Noosphere, the Way of the Tao, Union, Collective and Conscious, and so forth, that there's some, something intrinsic to the universe that can influence our choices and perceptions if we're mindful and don't act uh, rashly. Now, we don't really know what space-time geometry looks like. These are cartoons. Uh, Roger happens to be the world's expert in this with uh, coming up with spinners, spin networks, quantum geometry, and twisters, and this is a uh, twister, a picture of a twister. So uh, you can actually perhaps imagine these surfaces uh, separating 
and perhaps see some kind of Fibonacci geometry uh, in the background. Um, so that's, that's a good guess. We don't really know uh, what space-time looks like at the, uh, at the Planck scale. But it's pretty clear that there is space-time uh, curvature because of uh, the curvature of a distant star around the sun that Eddington showed, for example. In any case, this is the only mechanism for conscious experience ever proposed, other than either ignoring it or giving a hand-waving explanation of emergence, which doesn't really have any testable predictions. Now, these events occurring will willy-nilly everywhere in the table in the atmosphere in random polar environments would lack meaning and context and be proto-conscious. And metaphorically, these are like the sounds of an orchestra warming up, the tones and sounds of noise, basically, and then the symphony begins. And the question we raise, or suggest actually, is that life in the brain evolved to orchestrate consciousness as the music of the universe. Now, Roger and I met in the early 1990s. Uh, this was after the first Tucson con conference, and we started to develop our theory of orchestrated objective reduction, uh, which I don't have time to develop fully here, but you can imagine a microtubule or many microtubules with the grade being superposition so that a time t <coughs> e equals h over t is met, and there's a moment of conscious experience which correlates with a uh, collapse in space-time geometry, and the other <coughs> possibility would continue. But microtubes are still fairly macroscopic objects. We have to go even deeper. And if we look at one protein in a microtubule, this is a tubulin, we see all these pi resonance uh, uh, ring structures from aromatic amino acids. And uh, we, know that, we know that from photosynthesis that these uh, aromatics uh, are, uh, allow quantum uh, biology to occur. Uh, the light is harvested and transferred here by uh, exotons propagating through all these pathways simultaneously. And this occurs at warm temperature. Now this has several implications uh, for, because if, if OR was happening uh, all along before life began, it might have prompted the or origin of life. And in fact, life on Earth began in a primordial soup, it appears, uh, from which biomolecules uh, emerged. And in the 50s, this was, uh, this was simulated and they found organic uh, amphipathic mo biomolecules, these same pi resonance clouds with, with electron resonance clouds, which are dopamine-like, which is the pleasure molecule, which have nonpolar on one end and, and polar on the other. And they give rise to these pi resonance clouds, which are basically quantum uh, systems. And uh, oil and water don't mix, so operin suggested that these will coalesce, form nonpolar uh, interiors with polar and the uh, tails, and this was the first cell, uh, a mice cell, and the same thing happens in membranes and in nucleic acids. So all types of biomolecules have a nonpolar, quantum-friendly uh, region, what we call the, the, the quantum underground, uh, with polar uh, tails that can uh, reach out to the exterior. We also know that these pi resonance clouds will attract and oscillate in terahertz, and there's good evidence now for terahertz oscillations in living systems. So back in the primordial soup, uh, with a little imagination, we can see that maybe uh, uh, a more complicated version of this uh, micelle reached threshold and began to have uh, conscious moments, uh, some of which were pleasurable, and OR mediated pleasure could have sparked the origin of life and driven evolution. It's never made any sense to me why uh, simple organisms, or even us, would have complex behavior for survival of, of genes without any feelings. It makes, and especially since genes didn't even come along for a long time. So I've written a, a chapter now suggesting that uh, this uh, uh, quantum origin and, and the quantum pleasure principle in the primordial suit uh, prompted the origin of life. Uh, I'll briefly mention that anesthesia, which specifically raises consciousness, occurs with a bunch of different gases, and the correlation between the, the gas potency and, and uh, uh, gas potency and putting people, animals, flies, salamanders, elephants, it doesn't matter, correlates with their solubility in olive oil, which is the same type of pi resonance structures I was talking about. And uh, neurotransmitters and psychedelics have the same pi resonance clouds. And, uh, and we know that, uh, I showed this slide before. And there are basically two types of stable configurations of pi resonance clouds. And in uh, Tugelin, we have 86, so you can imagine a whole, uh, whole bunch of different uh, uh, emoticons or different possible feelings going on there. So the model basically suggests that there's these dipoles that can oscillate back and forth, and they occur over a spectrum going downward in scale. 
And there's good evidence for this now from Anurban Bandipati's group for neurons, individual microtubules, tubulins. It's going from terahertz, gigahertz, megahertz, uh, to kilohertz and hertz. And, uh, and we can, giving this picture, that there's a spectrum and these self-repeating patterns every several orders of magnitude that Anurban has found uh, tri what he calls triplets of triplets. And here at the terahertz, we've shown in some other work that anesthesia blocks, um, blocks these dipoles and, and dampens them, and that prevents uh, everything else. And we've also suggested that uh, EEG is a B frequency of these faster vibrations. So if you have a sequence of conscious moments, you also have this backward uh, information that can, that can rescue free will, as I mentioned before. So just to sum up on Orkawar language, the, the three problems, backward time referral can fill in missing or incomplete words. And this is uh, due to uh, an effect in space-time geometry. Aharono has suggested something like this. And Roger and, and Ben Schumacher have, have suggested that EPR experiments, when you make the measurement here, sends quantum information back to when the pair were together and then forward. Hierarchical organization correlated with EEG. I mentioned that EEG is beat frequencies of faster <coughs> microtubule vibrations. And finally, the X-bar structure uh, um, shown here. Uh, similar microtubules that uh, I'm working with uh, Chomsky and, and others to develop. So uh, here's a list of references and I'll just uh, conclude with the following four points. Quantum interactions, cognition manifest in a quantum underground in brain biology. Quantum biology is real. Forget Techmark, forget all those ridiculous uh, claims and attacks. They didn't know what they were talking about. There's quantum biology. It's in the quantum underground or what we call the Meyer Overton quantum underground. Um, Penrose OR mediated proto pleasure may have prompted the origin of life and is driving its evolution. Backward time effects, hierarchical organization, and Chomsky's universal grammar language may be implemented by quantum processes and microtubules inside neurons. In a very general sense, consciousness, cognition, and language are more like music than computation. I think the brain is more like an orchestra of a hierarchical vibrational system with consciousness able to to occur at different scales and actually several scales at the same time and move up and down. So uh, I think quant take quantum biology seriously and uh, it'll make things a lot more interesting. Thank you very much. Oh, golly. That's <laughs> I, I think that hand was up first, so I apologize if that's just the way I was working. I have two questions. When you say forget tag mark, but I would uh, appreciate you explaining how the decoherence rate, uh, uh, I think is the subject of what he talks about in his criticism of you all in a while, uh, is, it, is not consistent with your model. No, okay, let me, let me answer that first. Uh, he assumed the super, superposition separation distance of 24 nanometers. In our model, superposition separation distance is the Fermi length. That's seven orders of magnitude. He calculated 10 to the minus 13 seconds. That takes it down to 10 to the minus six. He had two other mistakes with his permittivity and something else that brought up, and we, my colleagues and I used his formula, recalculated, published in the same journal a year later, at 10 to the minus 4 seconds decoherence time. Banyapati has since found 10 to the minus 4 seconds, as well as faster ones. On top of that, you don't, we don't really need anything uh, uh, that slow because we can, have 10 to the, we can have megahertz oscillations that interfere and give B frequencies down into the slower. Uh, so the experimental, the theoretical, and the experimental evidence supports 10 to the minus 4 seconds, but we don't, we can, we can get by with 10 to the minus 7 seconds megahertz. Well, that's great. Uh, I'd like to know that. Um, my other question is, do you actually, let me just say that Roger and I wrote a, a review paper. It's, it's in that list uh, that we went through all uh, Tegmark and all of our critics, including the Australians, the Rhymers, and all, and they're all full of crap. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to see you next month. I'll ask him. Um, but. Uh, I was curious, you're uh, talking about quantum pleasure in yeah. a way, as an origin of life. Uh, can you define what pleasure is in quantum <coughs> Something that feels good because it resonates with deeper platonic values. Feels good to who? Feels, it's a feeling. It's a, there's no who yet. When you put a bunch of these together, that's how you get the, the I or the self and the who. It's just, uh, uh, feelings are intrinsic to the universe. That's a key point. Uh, okay. Martha? Um, can you say anything more about the implementation of the universal grammar? 
yet. I mean, We're just uh, to, start. so there's something at a, at a very small scale, but then obviously it's happening at a this sort of larger, slower time scale as well. I'm assuming the universal grammar. Well, your your brain is mostly made of microtubules. Microtubules are the most tubule is the most prevalent protein in your brain. All the rest is just to kind of uh, hold the microtubules. That's that's one way to look at it. So and microtubules are in all species. There are even uh, forms of them in, in, in bacteria and archaebacteria and so forth. So and their structure, the Fibonacci geometry, uh, gives rise to these patterns. We modeled them beginning in the early 80s and saw these these patterns, and they're, they're very much like the, the branching patterns seen in the in, in the X part structure. So I'll be working with uh, two linguistics professors at the University of Arizona as well as. Chomsky will be in, in Arizona in the spring, and we're going to have a, a, a public discussion about it. Stay tuned. Um, and there is a 50-minute gap between the end of this session and the lunch break. So I'm going to, since there is clearly a lot of questions for this talk, I'm going to... It's actually an hour and 45 minutes. We have a long break. It's an early time. Right. So I'm going to say we can have, a, you know, an hour and 40 minutes will be fine for lunch, and we'll have at least five minutes more questions. Um, Penty? Uh, are microtubules found also in other cells, or are they strictly in neurons? No, they're found in all cells. Every, everywhere. Right. In so uh, the but they're, they're, they're unique in, in neurons because uh, in all cells, they're, they're like spokes of a wheel. They start and, 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 they, they, and they go outward from the center. In, in uh, neuronal dendrites and soma, they're broken and interrupted of mixed polarity. So the fact that one goes up and one goes down mean, means if they're resonating, they're going to be slightly off because they're going to be in, so they're going to give rise to beat frequencies, and I think that's necessary for consciousness. And we know that consciousness comes from dendrites and, and soma because that's where anesthesia works, that's where EEG comes from. Okay. Let, let, let me take a quick straw poll of questions and put numbers on them. Who else wants to ask a question? Because there are clearly one, two, three, four, five. Okay, um, we'll, we'll do them in that order then. <laughs> My question to you, Grace, about first is feeling. You said that there is no who yet. So can you put what is the first, what is like secondary feeling, <coughs> consciousness, and uh, subject? If you're asking, you know, what point in evolution does does uh, does the self arise? I mean, it's 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 arbitrary. I, when you have a, a, enough uh, enough uh, feelings, what I'm saying is that the feelings of pleasure are the feedback fitness function for the system to grow and evolve in such a way to optimize feelings and pleasure. At some point, there will be a, a self for that organism. But, but uh, if, there, if there's feelings going on at this table right now, those feelings are what we call protoconscious. They don't have any self. They're not connected. They're kind of random and disjointed. So it's, at some point in, the, in evolution, uh, the self uh, or the I or the, uh, uh, emerges. Um, um, but I can't understand how it could be feeling without somebody who is filled with pleasure. How do you understand that? Well, because feelings are, are fundamental and, and uh, properties of the universe. You know, like mass of inner charge, consciousness. It, I, I should say that in, in the year 2000, uh, Nature uh, interviewed 10 prominent physicists of, for theory of everything. And only Roger Penrose included consciousness in the theory of everything. So mm -hmm. consciousness or its primitive precursors, feelings, must be intrinsic to the universe like mass of inner charge. At some point, when they get organized enough, we have a, a, an entity, a, a unit, a person, a self, or something like that. And then, when you meditate, you want to get rid of the self anyway. So I don't think you need a self to be conscious. Mm -hmm. And uh, you think I don't need even me or I? Well, you need you or I to get around and be functional. But if you were a blob, just, you could have feelings without necessarily being being Tatiana. You could just have pure feelings. Mm -hmm. Uh, my question comes in two parts. The first is more of a comment, and the second one is maybe a suggestion. The first is, uh, yeah, I really, in my being a computer scientist, um, Chomsky's work was very, very influential because a lot of the artificial languages that we know as computer languages really came from what his work. But the, the, the striking thing was that, and, and continues to be, that. That, that work really sort of kicked the legs out of structural linguistics, which didn't have any sort of hierarchical structure. It was just more languages understood in terms of association, like syntagmatic associations between words and paradigmatic association. And I think it's curious that 
in, in all, like when you look at search engines, machine learning, uh, the state of the art, a lot of that doesn't use any grammar. Yet nevertheless, it actually um, sort of can replicate to an interesting degree uh, human behavior in terms of um, understanding or dealing with language. So I'm, I'm wondering whether that it, it might be more interesting to look uh, look at this work to look at try and find syn the, the syntagmatic associations between words, or in the mental lexicon, as maybe as a first step. That's just uh, one comment. The second is the. Uh, it's interesting about you know you, you talked about contextuality. I know Anibar has is isolated a single um, microtubulum. So if you could run an experiment like an EPR experiment where you could actually have two microtubulins that are separate so you could, you could mitigate having them signaling to each other, then you would be able to use the standard experiments that use in physics in order to verify that there was contextuality going on in the sense that perhaps this community um, uh, uses. Uh, that's true. Uh, I should say that Anam has already shown that these effects in microtubes are quantum because, for example, the conductivity at, at, critical, at critical resonant frequencies through an entire microtubule, the resistance is lower than it is through a single tubule. So that has to be a quantum effect. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you, if you stimulate the microtubule at one of its resonant frequencies that I showed earlier, the whole microtubule is more conductive than individual tubules. He's also done something like that, EPR, where he stimulates one microtubule and sees an effect in another one. It could be fact, we're not quite sure yet. And finally, he just uh, called me uh, two days ago on my birthday and said that he discovered this <coughs> the terahertz flux in, a, in an artificial system of microtubules. So I'm looking forward to, to seeing that. And we'll probably go to Japan because, and then we'll see if we can anesthetize it. We want to see, because uh, if it's, even if it's an artificial system, if it's pi resonance cloud uh, pathways, it, sh it should be amenable to anesthesia. And then we'll see if. If it's, if it's inhibited by anesthetics proportional to their potency in, in erasing consciousness in, in people, for example, using different anesthetics. So there's a lot of opportunity for experiment, experimentation here. Cool. Okay, there were three more questions. I'm going to say, please keep them quick. Uh, maybe the, the following. On a more technological point of view, you talk about quantum computing, and, I, and then you also Chomsky, structural. Could you see some way of uh, building some basic components like, like gates based on your physical uh, structure, mi microtubules, that then yeah. you could build some uh, building blocks and use the logics of Chomsky, I don't know. Some, because when you look at people building quantum computers, they look at that, they look at, they have some physical uh, structure, the gates, and then they, 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 they develop logic about, around this and then perhaps they can get to, yeah. it's not linked to, con to, to consciousness, it's linked more to operational way of doing Right, uh, well first of all, let me say, I think, I think the biology with the nonpolar interiors, the quantum underground, is, allows quantum processes to go on inside. But you could replicate that in technology, yeah. and I just mentioned that what he's done now is build some kind of artificial microtubule using the Fibonacci geometry. I didn't mention that the helical, the helical pathways here uh, follow. Could you use carbon nanotubes? You could use carbon nanotubes or graphene or something like that. But what he's used exactly, I'm not sure, but, but I'm going to find out. And, uh, and you could develop those into circuits. So it's possible to build a quantum, I think it's possible to build a quantum computer based on artificial microtubules that could even uh, be conscious if, if consciousness is happening by the mechanism that Roger and I say. Are some people doing that? Yes, in Japan at, at SCUBA, at National Institute of Materials and Science, Honor Bon Bandipati. Uh, what you heard is correct. I think that the x bar scheme cannot be predicted from neural networks. Right? That's, that was one point. Right. But my question is can you really make prediction? Take, take into account that the x bar scheme consists of two parts. You have a number of categories. The number is four or five. That's what Jack and Tofu or other people assume. And the second is you have a number of, of projections. And also this number is fixed, three or four. What can you predict from the models? What I'm, number can you predict? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not an expert in linguistics. I'll be working with uh, uh, the, 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 the guys I mentioned and, and Chomsky himself. Uh, but but it, it, if the x bar is happening on a microtubule, there are a couple of implications that, that don't happen in these graphs that they show. 
first is that they're not symmetrical, they're skewed because of the Fibonacci. So they're, you're going to have a, some kind of bias. The second is that they're going to wrap around and interfere on the backside. So there's no necessarily boundary condition until you wrap around to the bottom of the microtubule. The implication of that, I'm not sure yet. I'm going to talk to the linguistics guys. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's what Chomsky would say. He said this is not the level of the description. It's yes. Higher level. Yes. Okay. And last question, and Jose, could you please come on the satellite? You know, on, on the Chomsky and universal grammar type question, I'm, uh, well, I'm advertising this book by Chomsky, uh, 2016. So my question is whether in this book uh, and the neuroscience with all these pictures of neurons and stuff, uh, how does that uh, compare to what you're presenting? Well, he wrote that before he met me. And uh, <laughs> okay. that, uh, we met, uh, no, I, I'm being a little bit flippant, but, but we met uh, a few months ago. And uh, by, uh, we were introduced by Massimo uh, Pietelli Pomerini, who's, uh, who's known about my work and, and wanted Chomsky to know about it. And we met and, and talked, and, and basically I, he, I showed him a lot of these slides and showed him what I was talking about. He got very intrigued about it. Intrigued. He also said, well, you, don't, you yourself don't know much about language, do you? I said, no, I, I admit that. He said, well, I don't know anything about, about microtubules. So, um, so um, we're going to uh, uh, hopefully collaborate with the other two guys I mentioned, and uh, we're going to have a, a public uh, forum in Tucson sometime in the spring with uh, him and I uh, on uh, language and consciousness. With the language part, you're, he still agrees with what he wrote uh, a few months ago? I'm not sure. Well, okay. Okay. I, I'm not sure. And he's gone on from expert to minimalist and, and something else. But it's all kind of the same thing as far as I can tell. Hmm? That's going to be a close to God's secret. <laughs> what? But they're all the same thing. Oh. <laughs> well, he kind of said that. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you again, and thank you everyone for inviting me.